If you're doing any of the six things I'm about to mention in this video, you are burning money at the stake. Don't miss this one. This video here is either going to save you money, piss you off, because I'm calling out maybe something that you do that you don't want to hear that you do, that you know you shouldn't do, or both. So not only am I going to list these out for you, but I'm going to give you possible solutions to the six ways the comic book hobby is tanking your wallet. Let's go. All right, number one, let's get the one that most people probably know out of the way first, and that is FOMO. If you don't know what FOMO is, it stands for fear of missing out. But let's get something straight right off the bat here. It is your God-given right to want something and to want something now. Just know that that right comes with a price. FOMO is one of the main ingredients that caused the comic boom of 2021 during the pandemic. Yes, of course, it was new collectors and stimulus checks all entering the hobby. But keep in mind, it was FOMO that caused even the experienced collectors to overspend on books. Disney was just coming off of Endgame, and at this point, they had done no wrong, could do no wrong. They had a brand new streaming service coming out that was going to be in millions of homes across the world, and they were going to bring with them a giant slate of brand new Marvel content. We saw what happened in Guardians of the Galaxy, what they could do with B and C list characters and make them household names. And a lot of us thought that that could very well translate into other characters. Now, when all this shit started to hit the fan, prices started to soar, people started thinking, well, shoot, I might never get to own the first appearance or the key issue of my favorite character. Moon Knight will be a household name. Little boys and girls will be snuggled up tightly underneath their conchu blankets. And Wolf by Night 32s are going to be given away as graduation gifts to eighth graders across the world. Now or never. If we only knew. If you are suffering from a case of FOMO, you know, try a couple of these steps. Once you hear the news and you have that urge to go and instantly buy something, wait seven days before you make the purchase. Set an alarm, come back. Seven days hits and you still feel that same way about spending that money at peak price, then allow yourself to purchase. And at least if you've waited seven days and you still feel the same way, you're probably going to have a less chance of buyer's remorse. Like, don't get it twisted. If you want to go out and buy a new Mutants 98 at peak price and take it with you into the movie theater as you watch Deadpool and Wolverine, well... And I'm proud to be an American. Number two on the list is not recycling. Nothing will sink your wallet faster than the repeat buying of the materials that it takes to sustain this hobby. All of it is burning a hole in your wallet, and here's what you can do with some of the materials to save money. Bags are a bit harder to reuse because as they degrade through the years, they need to be changed to keep your comic book from getting damaged. But don't underestimate the longevity of a solid backer board. First, I'm going to give you a failing idea of mine that maybe you'll have better luck with. At one point when I was cleaning and pressing my own comics or getting backer boards from collections that I would buy, I bought a paper shredder. And my idea was I was going to shred older backer boards and paper and use them as kind of like a fluff for whenever I ship comics instead of buying bubble wrap. I didn't really buy that expensive of one. I bought kind of a cheap one off of Amazon and I started to shred all this paper only to find out that it does leave a crap load of dust and it is kind of annoying. It's coarse and rough and irritating and it gets everywhere. Maybe some of you have access to a nicer paper shredder that won't have this dust effect that has sharper blades. I'm not sure, but hey, you know, maybe worth a shot. <laughs> What I like to do is I like to use older backer boards to bulk up uh, the storage of my key issues. This is great for my personal collection and then also selling. So I like it when a key comic book has a nice hardy backer board behind it. So if you take one fresh clean backer board and then two or three older backer boards and put them behind it, it gives the key issue more protection. And from a selling standpoint, when somebody picks that book up, it just feels like they're holding more of a high quality item in their hand. As far as shipping materials go, save everything. Save it all. As long as the structural integrity of all of these packaging materials are still intact, save the Geminis, the bubble wrap, the painter's tape. Even if you get graded comic books back from CGC and they come with those cardboard dividers, keep those. You can throw those into other shipping packages for extra rigidity if you're selling like a higher price comic book online. So make sure you recycle. The materials can add up quick. And not to sound like a Boy Scout here, but Captain Planet, man. It's good for the environment. 
Anybody else want to go green? Number three on the list, speculation. Speculation is FOMO's ugly cousin. We saw what happened with speculation in the 90s, and then we saw again what happened with speculation during the pandemic. If it's one thing that the pandemic taught us, it is how quickly the hype for a character can die out. Now, I'm not saying you can't speculate and make money, but I'm saying if you are going to partake, you need to be very well versed in two things. One, comic book storylines. Two, movie leaks. Leak culture is unfortunately one of the newest things to enter the cinematic industry that, you know, really kind of sucks. It ruins the experience for a lot of people. If you really want to maximize the potential for making money off of speculation, you need to closely follow movie leak culture. And when you do that, you go to the movies and it's just not as special. There's very little surprise when you're following leak culture. Now, let's say you don't care about leak culture. You don't care about spoilers. You know every Marvel timeline and which way a storyline can go. Even if you know the outcome, your timing for when you sell speculated comic books has to be so precise and so on point that if you miss it, it might not even be worth the time or the money anyway. We know by now that once a character is adapted from comic books to the screen, that that character can be changed in so many ways that, that by the time they get to the big screen, they are a pale comparison to their original comic book form. And that right there makes the demand for movie speculation not nearly as high. And if there's anything that the comic book market has taught us about speculation confirmation, once it hits the comic market, volume increases, not price. More books will sell, but they will not sell at a higher price. This is all because the supply that is out there is just way too high for some character's 15 minutes of fame. Now, Null would be a great example of this working out to the fullest, but look at what that comic had to do and go through to get to this point. It took for that key comic book to completely cool off to iceberg status, combined with heavy rumors that Null might transfer into the MCU after Venom for this comic book to get to where it's at now, and it's still not even what it was at its all-time high. Now, another dangerous speculation game is the new comic variant game. This is when you try to pick out out of the new comics hitting on new comic book date which variants might go up in value based off of their art form. Again, this is something that's very difficult to do, and the chances are very high that you're going to buy a variant that will never be worth more than what you paid for it on the day that it came out. You really have to have an eye for what is mass appealing in art, and not only that, what is different about an art piece. That's really where comic variants soar and actually have some longevity in the marketplace is that piece of art has to be different than everything else that comes out. And even when you have those two ingredients, mass appeal, uniqueness, you have to combine that with the probability that this book was under-ordered. And if you choose correctly, timing is king. Don't even get me started on new character spec. If you go in that game, you're better off speculating in the indie comic market where most of the originality, passion, and creativity still lies. Marvel and DC are brands that are dwindling in creativity due to their longevity, their years and years of trying to recycle characters and storylines. Every new character that comes out right now from Marvel and DC is some sort of alteration or mashup of an already existing character. Mainstream comic publishers are just printing or trying to print money and the paper that they're printing on is getting very thin. The water's getting warm so you might as well swim. Exercise with caution. Now number four on the list is actually the habit of not doing something. Number four is not funding the hobby. Funding the hobby doesn't mean that you have to open up a brick and mortar store or, or even set up at a, at a comic con. Knowing what is valuable and knowing when you see it at a deal and buying it at that point in order to flip it. It's not trying to get rich or retire, it's just called funding the hobby, making it pay for itself. This is one of the driving factors in that whole buying what you love is bullshit video that I made. Look, if you're giving the buy what you love advice to a new collector, the chances are that a new collector is coming into the hobby because they love something. Maybe they saw a movie or they, you know, got into a certain character and they want to know more and read more. People entering the hobby are typically in it because they love something. It's already in their brain, I'm going to buy what I love. Very few people enter the comic book hobby because they're trying to get rich or retire off of it. It's a physical media. It's a dying thing. Brick and mortar is dying. Physical media is dying. It's collected primarily on a nostalgia base. So new collectors, here's my motto. It's not buy what you love. Fund what you love. Smarter way to go about it. And another small tip when it comes to funding the hobby is 
it might be in your advantage to start an LLC. This is something that you want to ask your CPA before you go out and do, of course. But starting an LLC could actually uh, allow you to write off some of the expenses such as materials and fees that we spend throughout the year uh, and put some of that money back into your pocket. Ask your CPA if you think that you're in a position where you sell enough and spend enough to start an LLC. Number five is another byproduct of the pandemic and something that still people tend to do and that is unnecessary comic book grading the percentage of all comic books that are out there that actually deserve and should be graded is probably less than one percent actually it's definitely less than one percent it might be less than half percent compared to what is actually printed I can tell you for me personally in my collection the comic books that you're seeing plus a few graded short boxes underneath me less than one percent of my entire comic book collection uh, is graded so what is worth grading? Obviously, personal preference. If you just want to see that book in a case with a number on it, well, then none of this even matters to you. More than likely, it's going to 100% be a negative return of investment for you. But if you're happy looking at it, that's all that matters. And I'm proud to be an American. Now, from a financial standpoint, well, typically valuable golden and silver age comic books, um, you know, key issues that are in poor, poor condition is typically a good idea for you to grade those comics or at the very least encapsulate them in something. Grading will help secure their value based on the third party number that is given to them when it comes to resale and even stuff like insurance claims. Now, if it's anything other than what I just mentioned, you got to look at the comic's potential value based on what you put into it and the probable grade that that comic is going to get. You kind of need to know about market value. You need to know how to properly grade a comic book. Even at its worst state, what's the potential market value for this book? So here's what I do. If I'm grading a comic book, uh, it typically, one, the book has to be rare in that grade, which will typically translate to a value. Or two, if the expected grade that the comic book will get once graded must be two or three times the amount of money I have fully into that graded comic book, which means... Grading fees, shipping fees, and selling fees once sold. So for instance, if I bought a book for $50, got it graded and shipped to me for $35, and then the selling fee of that book, let's say, is going to be $20, I'm going to get a book graded that will be worth at least $200. Another thing to keep in mind when deciding to grade your comic book, especially modern comic books, is in modern comic books, and I'm talking, you know, 1990-ish, right? It was on late Copper Age to now. In modern comic books, 99% of the time, 9.8 or bust. Modern comic books need to be at a 9.8 grade or the value is just not there. But anything other than that on a modern comic book, unless it's a very large key issue, it's 9.8 on bust. This goes for modern and ratio variants as well. This is why it's very important in grading companies to use pre-screens, 9.8 pre-screens, which is if the book doesn't hit the 9.8, they send it back to you and they don't charge you the money to ship it. They might charge you a small fee, $8 or something like that. But let me tell you, getting comic books graded the correct way, um, especially when you clean and press, is one of the most fun uh, parts of the comic book hobby that I enjoy. You just need to do it smartly. Otherwise, you are just setting your money ablaze. What's about sending a message? Now for number six. The final habit that you might have being a comic collector that is going to make you burn money. And that is being influenced. Hey, don't listen to me. All right. This is a little uh, kind of almost not really hypocritical, but this needs some further explanation. I'm somebody who's making YouTube videos, and I'm telling you right now, don't be influenced. Well, when I say don't be influenced, let me rephrase this. Don't be weak-willed and don't be weak-minded. If that offends you, I'm just trying to help. <laughs> just because you are watching a Hot 10 list or a movie trailer is not a signal for you to go and buy a comic book. It does not mean that you need to go buy a comic book. This also translates in your peers, in the community, right? Uh, staying in your lane, looking at your own path, not looking to the side of you, hey, my buddy's got this book. I need to also have that book to feel uh, equal. We are all 
on our own paths of collecting here. One of the most mentally damaging things that you could do to yourself as a comic book collector is compare your collection uh, to that of the people around you or even the people that are online. We're all on different paths. It is the path that is set for you that is fun. Think of it as a video game. You know, you don't want all the cheat codes. Like, your levels are hard for you, and that's what makes the game fun. Play your game, ride your wave, you know, uh, whatever corny analogy you want to use, do it. But just keep your eyes on your own shit. Now, up until this point, I've avoided talking about comic book drama that doesn't pertain to me personally. If it's not on me, my channel, or involve me, I've avoided talking about all the comic book drama that's been circulating around YouTube lately. But finally on my channel, this is a good opportunity to bring up the Sticky Goose situation. Because now his drama serves purpose. Now his drama comes with knowledge. What do I mean by this? No matter how you feel about Sticky Goose, I think his name is... Daniel, I think, uh, apologies if I got that wrong, but I think his name is Daniel, so I'm going to call him Daniel. No matter how you feel about Daniel, he's said insulting things, he's said cringy things, he's said a lot of things that just trigger a lot of people, right? It's, it's, uh, it's what he kind of jumped on that he thought worked. So no matter how you feel about him, that man has actually made a huge sacrifice. He has literally sacrificed his pride on his channel in front of thousands of people and thousands of his peers in order for him to learn a lesson. And if you're paying attention to what was going on in that podcast, it is a lesson that a lot of people can still learn. Now, I'm not saying he's comic copy Jesus or anything. Let me kind of paint for you the big picture of what he did and then the good that came out of it. But him being publicly obliterated on his own podcast was a pure display of somebody who was completely jaded uh, by the pandemic and other people's in the uh comic community and the content creating community and he says all this in his uh his response video you know he knows all this stuff and that's that's kind of the beauty in it is that he knows it and that again if you're paying attention you can learn the lesson from his mistake funny thing is daniel and myself we both got in during the pandemic and the two of us go about this hobby have gone about this hobby completely different and both of our perspectives on single issue comic collecting are completely different at this point. The pandemic was going on and everything was skyrocketing. I took all of that hype and, and all of that buzz in the comic community and even the content creator community, and that fueled me to hunt, not to spend. I was going out there working to find comic book collections and hunting single issue comic books at the best prices that I could find. I was hunting deals rather than hunting books. For me, when a movie comes out or whenever I see a, a comic book on a hot 10 list or even whenever I'm shown something on YouTube, watching content of other people, because I watch content as well. We all watch content on YouTube. When I see something that I resonate with, that aligns with my love of collecting, I don't think I need to go out and buy that right now. My thought process is I can't wait to run into that one or I can't wait to flip enough comic books to where I earn that money and buy that book. And that is the thought process that will save you more money than anything in this hobby. If you watch that video, his reluctance to kind of be a proactive seller slash funder of the hobby, you know, seems like it's fuel for why he feels as jaded as he did. You know, if all of these books behind me were to go to zero, or nothing's going to ever go to zero, but if let's say if, if everything just were to drop, I'm into all of these books for so little money that... Mentally and financially, I, it, won't, it won't be a hardship. I will still love the books for you know, the books that they are. And all of this comes down to the decisions you make uh, when you bring your books to the counter. Don't be poorly influenced. Don't be weak-willed and try to exercise patience in this hobby. Your wallet will thank you. So if at any point in time you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more. See you on the next page.